Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for coming to this conference. Uh, it's great to have everyone here. As we know, the situation in Kashmir is getting uh, more intense, um, as we've seen previously from this week and over the few months, even after lockdown, things have really intensified. So it's very important that there's a kind of peaceful resolution and um, everyone sort of comes together to find a peaceful solution to some, you know, kind of this very grave conflict which has been going on for very long. So I want to thank all members of parliament, um, all activists, everyone who's worked on this issue for joining us today, especially as everyone's so busy because of COVID-19. So thank you very much. I'm going to begin with uh, Fahim Kiani. Fahim's probably going to start by just uh, having a chat and introducing um, everyone um, and starting with kind of a brief on this conference. And then we'll move on to His Excellency President of Azar Jammu and Kashmir, um, Sajar Masood Khan. So I'll hand over to Fahim now. If everyone can mute their mics. Asalaamu Alaikum, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to welcome everyone and thank for your participation in this international virtual uh, conference titled Twin Lockdown in Kashmir and Global Response through Video Link. Uh, the purpose of this conference is to highlight the suffering of innocent Kashmiris who have been living under Indian brutal occupation, subjugation and oppression for more than 70 years. Kashmir has been under Indian siege for more than 11 months. Kashmiris have been systematically, economically destroyed and they are in need of urgent food and medicine. Uh, but the Indian regime is not providing any help and is even refusing international relief agencies access into Kashmir. Uh, British Kashmiris, Pakistanis and all peace-loving people want to send aid to Kashmir through British charities. However, this is being denied. The United Kingdom uh, should uh, should put pressure on India to allow access for British charities into Kashmir. I hope uh, His Excellency Sardar Masood Khan, President of Azad Jammu and Kashmir, will explain in detail in his speech how India is committing constitutional terrorism alongside state terrorism by amending the, the domicile law and abrogating Article 317 35A. In this situation, Tari Kashmir UK decided that Indian efforts to change the demography of Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir should not go unnoticed while India is using the cover of COVID-19. The world is fighting against COVID-19, but India is killing innocent Kashmiris. I would like to quote an incident which took place the day before yesterday in Sopur, Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. A three years old child witnessed the brutal murder of his grandfather uh, who was killed by Indian army and his body was left on a, uh, on a road and the child was, and child sat on his grandfather's body for an hour. There's a long list of, uh, atrocities committed by Indian Army. I have a limited time, uh, so I can't uh, describe all this incident in a limited time. I believe that uh, we in the United Kingdom have an obligation and opportunity to stand for justice, provide support to victims, and ensure the voice of the oppressed people of Kashmir is heard. Freedom for all, freedom for Kashmir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna mute myself. I'm gonna listen to my stream speaker. Thank you very much. So if uh, the president could uh, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, there may be people around the world for whom it would be good evening. Uh, first, I want to thank Mr. Fahim Kiani, President of Tehrik Kashmir, United Kingdom, for organizing this webinar. Again, this is very timely, and uh, here from Pakistan, Azad Kashmir, I'm joined by Mr. Altaf Hart and Mr. Altaf Lani, and all the distinguished I, I believe the president is having a slight glitch. Present uh, in this webinar. Uh, can you hear me? 
yes we can hear you Abbas. yes we can hear you yeah all right you can hear me yeah. uh, if you, if you have missed the first part of what i was saying uh, I just want to repeat it that I am thanking all the parliamentarians who are present here today. Can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yes, or is there a glitch? Yes, you can. You can hear me. Yes. So can. I can continue. I can continue. Um, so all the parliamentarians who are here, I want to thank them. To they have given their time to Kashmir. So I am grateful to them, all of them, on behalf of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, uh, the moderator said that uh, the situation in the occupied Jammu and Kashmir is intense, and in fact, it is intense. It is deteriorating very fast. And uh, the apt way to describe the situation would be that there is a human rights and humanitarian crisis in the occupied territory, and it is deepening by the day. Now, let me tell you that uh, Last year, on August the 5th, India uh, rescinded two of its uh, constitutional articles and uh, took away from the Kashmiris autonomy, their flag, their constitution, and it invaded the territory, it occupied the territory, and it is turning the territory in territories. This was colonization because now these two union territories are being governed and ruled by Delhi directly, the capital of the Indian Union. And uh, um, this has been done without the consent of the people, the first step or the second step. So uh, the people of Jammu and Kashmir are captive in their own homeland. They've been made aliens in their own homeland. And the court, uh, domicile rules, which means that uh, there were certain reserved rights for the people of Jammu and Kashmir, according to a law which was first passed in 1927 under the rule of Maharaja. And it was then incorporated into the Indian constitution which said that uh, Kashmiris, as the original inhabitants of the land, will have exclusive property, uh, educational scholarships, and uh, jobs. All those rights were taken away by rescinding Article 35A of the Constitution. Now, <clears throat> this year, on was focused on uh, COVID-19, uh, India struck again. I mean, I would say the Bhatia Janata Party and the Rashiya Swayam Sevak Sangh, this duo, this combined, struck again. And uh, uh, they introduced these new rules, which says that anybody from India who's lived in Kashmir for uh, 15 years, I mean, mostly these are armed forces, these occupation forces or civil servants, anybody who's served in Kashmir for 10 years in educational institutions or um, uh, public organizations, their families, their children, they qualify for residence, permanent residence in the occupied territory. On the other hand, these uh, you know, people of Jammu and Kashmir, the original inhabitants, the indigenous population, the Kashmiris, and bulk of them are Muslims. They'll have to prove that they are Kashmiris, that this land belongs to them. Now, I have uh, said on many occasions that these measures are akin to what was done by the Nazis and they wanted it to native Hindus uh, in order to uh, make or effectuate permanent demographic changes. So this is what is happening there. Um, I'll talk about it uh, a little later. But what uh, the people participating, I mean, and the participants of this seminar need to understand is that uh, Kashmir is suffering from twin lockdowns. Of course, 
the lockdown that started last year on August the 5th, and it is asphyxiating because it's a siege. It's not a lockdown. And uh, the second lockdown, of course, is COVID-19. Uh, the purpose of the second lockdown all over the world is to save lives. Uh, we, we can't hear you. Any measures? I mean, some wallet. Have you lost me? Yes. So. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you. All right. I'll resume. So I was talking about uh, these uh, new domicile rules and about twin lockdowns. And I said that uh, uh, one lockdown saves lives. The COVID-19 lockdown is designed to save lives. Whereas the siege that has been imposed by India on the occupied territory is designed to kill people. Them of the, all the fundamental, it's like a first, you know, uh, it is like a predator raping somebody and saying, uh, um, We're making love. I mean, that kind of narrative, which is unacceptable to people of Jammu and Kashmir because they are resisting this kind of occupation of the territory and uh, brutalization of its people. The economy of the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir has also suffered massively because uh, uh, most of the farmers used to rely on the crops of apples, or walnuts, or saffron. And uh, since last uh, this year, because of COVID-19, the economic situation has seen a sharp downturn. Now, <clears throat> this is not all. I was talking about the uh, these Nazi fascist uh, domicile rules, uh, which target basically 480,000 jobs of the Kashmiris and uh, they want to grab their land, killings are going on. Under the cover of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, India has accelerated, I mean, in occupation forces have accelerated um, murders of Kashmiri youth uh, during cordon and search operations, but basically this is a euphemism for staged encounters or fake encounters. In fake encounters, um, their official figures say that in the past six months, they have killed about 200 young men. Uh, but the real figure is much higher. Uh, their DG police, Director General Police, has confessed that in the past two weeks they have killed uh, 22 what they call militants and uh, 42 in the month of June. So there's a killing spree going on in the occupied territory. But I think that the real count is much. Um, I'm just going to interrupt there. Um, the president is having a few issues with his mic. Um, I'd like to bring him back on. Uh, afterwards, uh, until he can fix the technical issues. Can I have the next speaker, please? Um, so uh, can I have Liam Burton? And, uh, uh, Hello, Mr. President, can you hear me? Mr. President, we'll have you back on later. Yes, um, I can hear you clearly, but yeah. uh, somehow you can't hear. Yeah, so Mr. President, is it okay if we All bring right. you on later? Yes, thank you. And can I have Liam Byrne on, please? Uh, Uzma, thanks very much indeed. And um, President, it's a great pleasure to be able to join you um, and um, colleagues from around the world on this call. Uh, my thanks as ever to uh, Faim for um, his organisational skills and um, uh, discipline in, in, in keeping us well focused um, on this issue. I think the recent um, conflagration uh, between India and China it's just underlined for many of us uh, the risks which are at play here. Um, in the narrative in the UK about uh, the urgency to resolve this, we often hear uh, that we must get this 
uh, on a track to peace because this is a conflict between two nuclear powers. And people will have heard me say many times before, this is not a, a, a risk to, of conflict between two nuclear powers, it's a risk of conflict between three nuclear powers. And I think the conflict with China has just underlined that. Uh, the most important geopolitical um, ref set of changes which are coming in the next 20 years is the creation of One Belt, One Road, uh, as China begins to um, help build an economic infrastructure to its west. Um, and that just escalates the risks dramatically. And so the world has a shared interest in making sure that there is a path to peace. And we know that there is no path to peace uh, unless there is a path to justice. And there is no path to justice unless there is justice for the people of Kashmir and the implementation of um, the UN Security Council resolutions that were agreed all of those years ago. Now, there have been something like 250 uh, dangerous armed conflicts around the world since World War II. Uh, about 150 of them were uh, brought to a conclusion uh, through negotiation. The most significant though, have never been resolved with a simple old fashioned bilateral negotiation uh, between the powers at stake. That is not how we brought peace to Northern Ireland um, in our own country. Uh, we relied on a third party, Senator George Mitchell, uh, who came in from the United States to help bring two opposing sides uh, to their senses. Uh, that is not how we brought peace to the former Yugoslavia. Uh, we brought in Richard Holbrook from the United States in order to broker peace in the former Yugoslavia. That's not actually how we made the big breakthroughs in the Middle East. Actually, the Camp David Accords overseen by President Carter were absolutely essential in bringing uh, Egypt and Israel to the negotiating table for the first time. I think it is therefore pretty fanciful to pretend that uh, India and Pakistan will be able to resolve uh, this injustice uh, peacefully. I have always thought that it is important for us to say that human rights is always an international issue uh, and therefore the United Nations and international uh, peacekeeping mechanisms should always be deployed in the first instance. But I think we have to recognise that there will need to be outside parties that come in uh, to help us broker peace because what most of us see happening in India um, is a sectarian populism uh, which is destroying the founding vision of India and leading to a world that is more and more dangerous. And we saw that most graphically uh, with the deaths of the Indian soldiers recently in the conflict uh, with China. So uh, I'm just very grateful that um, you've been able to bring this debate uh, to us today in order to keep the minds of British parliamentarians focused on this. Um, I also speak, I suppose, as chair of the Global Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and, and the IMF. Um, and one of our partners, the Inter International Parliamentary Union, um, recently discussed with us on a, on a call how around the world COVID is being used by autocratic regimes uh, to silence debate and democracy. That is not how we recover from a crisis. So uh, India is not alone in using this current crisis um, to create a, a fog uh, an, uh, of uncertainty in which further human rights abuses um, are perpetuated. So, you know, we continue, um, I think, to need to press in our own parliament uh, for a much more assertive posture from the UK government uh, towards uh, Mr Modi. Um, and we have got to expose the use of COVID um, as a way of creating that uh, fog for, uh, to disguise human rights abuses. But you know, my own view sometimes is not popular in my own party when I say this, uh, but my own view is that we need to drop the pretense that this issue is going to be solved bilaterally. Yes, we have to work hard, harder to get um, uh, human rights in the area back into the spotlight. Um, and ministers do agree, they do admit that Human rights are always an international issue. But over and above that, I think there has to be a group of us that continues to use the arena of parliament to press for sensible uh, third party involvement in trying to broker peace. So, uh, Uzma, let, let, let me stop with, um, uh, let, let me stop there in order to make sure that others have got plenty of time to contribute.
Thank you. We've got quite a few MPs who need to go to their meetings at five. So could I have uh, Alex Norris next? Thanks, Uzma, and thank you, Mr. President, for, for having us and, and for convening this important meeting. I think I'd like to say at the outset the profound thank you that, that um, myself and colleagues in Nottingham, and I know Nadia will be following me shortly, have um, for... Sorry, I didn't know my video wasn't running. Uh, have for the exceptional contribution that the Kashmir diaspora has made in Nottingham over the years in general, but during this exceptionally challenging time throughout public services, private sector, everywhere, to keep Nottingham going under very challenging COVID circumstances. We are really grateful for that. And we're very, very lucky to have the community that we have. It feels to me that our challenge works on two levels now because, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran of these conversations or when we were able to meet as the APPG or, or whether it was virtually as we gathered from around the world um, prior to COVID and prior perhaps to the last general election. Um, but today's challenges do give us an extra dimension because we know that the impact, as Liam says, of lockdown is being used in parts of the world by those who would choose to do so in order to erode human rights and that it's a very, very convenient uh, method of doing so and that's not something that we can tolerate and it's something that we as parliamentarians have to use our precious platform to talk about so I would ask that you know we, we heard a little bit at the beginning um, around some of the things that have happened under lockdown if you could share that with us so that we can use our precious and privileged platform to give that a voice in the UK then I think that would be a good thing because then that strengthens our hand to press the Foreign Secretary to be stronger and to be more assertive in his engagement uh, with Mr Modi and you know it helps us tell the stories in those facts so the, the Covid is the very is, is, the, is a new and a, a today context but we cannot lose sight of the longer term and, and of, of course the term has been too long too long since those UN resolutions were made and, and, have, and have fallen by the wayside and been ignored and we again have a very precious platform in Parliament. We have a very special responsibility uh, as, a, as the United Kingdom to take a stand and to have a say. And um, we are keen to use our precious space in Parliament to do exactly that. Um, so that, you know, that is a commitment from me and, and from my colleagues in, in, in order to do so. But it, the thing that makes the biggest difference, however, is, is helping us tell those stories. Because the, the overarching the overarching narrative is one of injustice. It's just, it isn't tolerable that so long ago, so many decades ago, there could be UN resolutions and that they could be ignored. You know, these are critical parts of international architecture that we think are a really important part of having a, rule, a rules-based international order. Um, so it's not tolerable to ignore those. But similarly, just talking about that isn't succeeding for us. We need to tell the story also in human terms you know, some of the reports that, have been, that were produced at the end of last year really helped us do that. Um, so it is important that you keep sharing those stories, both under COVID, but in general too, because we have an obligation and responsibility to, to tell that story, to make that clear on the public stage, to work collectively, to work cross-party, to engage with ministers, to be clear that we don't want us to be um, passengers in this, and that whether, when there are human rights struggles, we won't walk past them, and we will play a role in them. So that's a commitment from me. I know that'll be a commitment for colleagues from all parties, but please use us in that way and please engage with us in that way. Thanks, Asma. Um, if I could have, uh, Rachel, are you still there? No, I think Rachel's, Rachel had to go to a meeting. Um, I think if we could have Stella Creasy now. Thank you, Asma. Um, and thank you, Mr. President, for making time to meet with us. Uh, I think it is a good example that we may be physically very distant, but we share common challenges. Not least, I have found that on Zoom, if I put my camera on, it definitely affects my broadband connection. And so it's hard for people to hear me. So I do apologize. I'm not using my camera, but I want to make sure that I don't cut out. I'm extremely grateful to Fahim as well for organizing this briefing, because I think it is very easy for people to say at this time when there is a pandemic that our focus must be on the immediate, that our focus must be um, on what is in front of us in terms of our local communities. And therefore that somehow we as UK parliamentarians should not be talking about 
our concerns about human rights issues around the world. And for many of us who have stood alongside the Kashmiri communities, not just in our own constituencies, but internationally for some time, I think now and more than ever, it is very important to say, as my colleagues have said, that we will not let this situation be something people are not talking about or holding governments to account for. Um, especially with what we've seen in terms of recent events around the border and also some of the shocking stories about um, human rights abuses. I also think now is the time for us to ask, given the length of time of this crisis, why change hasn't happened, why we have seen indeed Prime Minister Modi exacerbate the situation um, and what it is that we want our government to be doing. And I know I will commit myself to working with my colleagues across Parliament to continuing to raise this issue in Parliament and continuing to ask those questions of the Foreign Office, not just because we have a history of obligations towards the people of Kashmir, but because it is absolutely right that at a time of crisis, human rights come to the fore. And I think Alex is right about the... Um, the stories that we've heard, but I also just want to touch on the human consequences for our communities here in the UK who are desperately worried for friends and family in Kashmir, desperately concerned about what is happening and desperately frustrated that they see a political process that seems to be moving backwards, not forwards. Um, my colleague Liam is absolutely right. This is unlikely to be something that can be solved by two parties alone. But I have faith that if the world were to continue to look along and look and get involved, that we could make progress. Now, that might require some very tough conversations at the United Nations. It requires some very tough actions by the UN Security Council. But we have moved issues forward before as a world community. And so it behoves all of us to refuse to let the pandemic be an opportunity for people to excuse themselves from those necessary but difficult conversations and obligations. Uh, in particular, it would be incredibly helpful. I recognise that um, Foreign Affairs will come back to the UK Parliament shortly to hear your thoughts, Mr President, about what issues in particular you would like us to press the ministers on and how you see the opportunities that will come from the UN Security Council, not just to challenge uh, what is happening immediately in Kashmir, but finally to make progress on the obligations of those resolutions. I think you will find in this conversation and in the cross-party working that we are all prepared to do, many hands that want to lift up your voice and ensure people are heard. But right now, we have to make sure that the airtime that COVID is taking up in the UK Parliament does not become used as an excuse by the government to say, well, we'll put this in the box to deal with for later, because I fear that if we don't deal with this now, the situation will continue to deteriorate. I want to say thank you for the support that you have given to my community in Walthamstow on this matter and the briefings that you've given because it's incredibly helpful. And I want to pledge myself again to being part of that process of continuing to push for peace and justice and social progress for the people of Kashmir in the years ahead. So if we could now have, uh, let's see, Alex Stella, um, Nadia, please. Thanks so much, Ms. Ma. Um, and thank you, Mr. President, for making the time to speak with us. I'm very grateful for your time, and it's fantastic to follow from my colleagues, Stella, Alex, and Liam. I wrote about the crisis in Kashmir. I wrote an article about it last year, not far off 11 months ago, and it's devastating that absolutely nothing has changed since then. In fact, the situation has only escalated and got worse. Modi has effectively declared war on the people of Kashmir by revoking Articles 370 and 35A of the Indian Constitution, um, with tens of thousands of troops descending on Kashmir, with political leaders under house arrest, the blackout in communications, and of course the widespread human rights abuses, some of which are only just coming to light. Of course, this foremost impacts the Kashmiri people, um, and in particular, the majority, around 70% Muslim population. But I'm also very conscious that this is impacting the Muslim minority in India, and that Muslims in India are the main targets of Modi's far-right Hindu supremacist government. 
and also of course that we have our communities in, in the UK, the biggest diaspora Kashmiri community in the world, who are also being hugely impacted by this. As Stella and others have said, we can't allow the, the Indian government to use this, to use lockdown and to use coronavirus as a further excuse to violate human rights. But we also can't allow our own government to use this as an excuse to gloss over human rights abuses and not step up to the mark and play our, our international role and our duty in addressing them. What really concerns me is the rate at which this far right Hindutva project in India is escalating. And as a labour movement, um, and you know, I'm like others have said, I'm committed to working cross party on this as well. But we need to be very clear in saying that an injury to one is an injury to all, that we need to be standing against human rights abuses and the suppression of democracy all over the world. And I think there are, there are several things that we need from our government, very clear things. One is a clear condemnation of the Indian government, demanding the reinstatement of Articles 317 and 35A, demanding immediate and urgent military de-escalation, suspending arms sales, sending international observers to Kashmir and publicly asserting the Kashmiri people's right to self-determination. Because just like in Palestine, peace in Kashmir, as others have said, it depends on justice and it depends on the right to self-determination. So to sum up, I'm, I'm really keen to, to work with colleagues across the house and to work with you, Mr. President, on what would be most useful for us to be raising in our role as parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you. Could we now have Jim on, please? Hi, thank you. Uh, pleasure to meet you again, uh, Mr. Carl. Uh, and uh, so great to see uh, friendly faces around the screen of people who have been part of this conversation and campaigned for quite a long uh, time. Fahim, thank you. Uh, to you for uh, pulling this together. Um, I think, you know, we can't allow the current COVID crisis to stop our international responsibilities uh, more broadly and also not, you know, reflect that um, it's worse now than perhaps uh, for a long time in terms of the international community uh, being able to look in. Uh, Uzma, can I thank you for the work that you've done behind uh, the scenes to uh, make this meeting happen? Uh, and to make sure that people broadly turn up on time. Um, I know that's no uh, mean feat from the meetings that we've had uh, before to do that. So thank you for that. I mean, I suppose for me, I'm kind of looking towards next week and the 8th of July uh, and thinking that will be a year since the UN Human Rights Commissioner published the report on the human rights violations that were taking place against the Kashmiri people. And we have seen almost no progress. We've seen almost no uh, international assertion uh, of that international uh, rule of law uh, and the protection of human rights. Uh, we've seen very little from the UK government uh, in taking a leadership uh, role in this. And this is natural, uh, of course, to reflect um, that this is an issue that cannot be resolved uh, unless we see a willingness from both Pakistan and India uh, it's got to be done by consent. It's got to be done by working together. But, of course, that won't happen back soon, and we've seen that now uh, over 70 years uh, of inaction when the human consequences are significant. And so I do feel as though the UK government needs to decide what role it wants to play in the world. Does it want to be a spectator? Does it want to turn a blind eye? Or actually, does it want to uphold the international rules, the order-based system, that we all sign up to because we believe in the rights of human beings wherever they may be on this planet and i'm afraid you know for too long uh, that hasn't uh, followed i mean the thing that stood out for me was when the lockdown first came in august um the the, the mood in my town in oldham where we have a very large uh, kashmiri heritage community wasn't actually one of anger which i expected to be honest it was one of 
uh, sadness. It was one of desperation. Uh, and it was one of fear, actually, where they couldn't get through to their family members. You know, I'm, you know, and I'm not talking about distant family members. I'm talking about brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who they could not make contact with, and they were fearful about what was happening uh, to them. And to be honest, they were right to be fearful. You know, since uh, that lockdown began in August, we've seen 4,000 uh, uh, people uh, affected uh, by that. And it shows no signs of being resolved anytime soon. I think we have made reasonable progress as a cross-party group of parliamentarians, uh, where actually we just want to make progress on this. But it's also fair to say that we haven't made the impact that we wanted to make in terms of actually having a tangible uh, improvement that people in Kashmir and the region will be able to see. And so I think the reflection that I would have today is, you know, what can we do collectively as parliamentarians with a platform that we've got across political party to make sure not that this is raised again, because we'll keep on raising it because we care about the issue, right? But it's what tangible actions can we have that progresses this? And first of all, we see a cessation of the human rights violations uh, that are taking place uh, in India occupied Kashmir. Uh, and that's got to be a matter of urgency because actually it doesn't matter where you stand in a sense uh, on whether there should be a plebiscite uh, in Kashmir and whether we should be moving towards self-determination. It doesn't matter whether you believe in that or not in a sense. If you just believe in human rights and that every human being has a right to live their lives without interference, harassment, abuse, uh, the threat of death and violence, which hopefully we all agree uh, with, then you can't turn a blind eye and you've got to take action. And I think the very fact that that's now been uh, outlined in the UN uh, report that was issued, I think the very fact that India will not allow uh, independent observers to go and actually see for themselves what's going on uh, is telling in itself. Um, but the danger with these type of issues is we, we can all say, and every nation in the world can say, uh, this is an international issue that requires the international community to do something about it almost as if we're all waiting for another country to take the leadership role. And, and if that happens, then maybe we'll come in in support of that. Uh, and I'll just say this finally, uh, the UK, as much as it might wish to, uh, cannot forget that it has a, a historic role. It has a moral obligation to make sure that it sees peace in that region for all the reasons that are well uh, rehearsed. And obviously whatever role that I can play uh, in doing that, in convening, in adding to the conversation, in press, in, in parliament, in coming to events uh, like this, then, then I will. Because the thing actually that I, that I really remember from last year in response to lockdown, and we, went, we had an event in Manchester at Piccadilly Gardens where hundreds of people turned out uh, in solidarity. But actually, even in Oldham, you know, a small town in the north of Greater Manchester, we had about 150 local people who came out to our main town square to show solidarity and support and stand together in unity. And for me, that was so powerful because that, what that said to me was, this is not a conflict in a distant land 4,000 miles away. This is a conflict that affects people in their homes, in their hearts, uh, in a town like Oldham. And because of that, we've got an obligation to do something about it. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Could we now have, because um, we're just keeping an eye on the time constraint, could we now have Brendan? <clears throat> so Brendan O'Hara is there. Hi, Uzma, and, and thank you, and thank you to Fahim for inviting me along uh, the, the, this afternoon. I'm, I'm hugely grateful to you, Mr. President, for taking the time to update us on what's happening in Kashmir. And it is disappointing, but not unsurprising, that the COVID-19 pandemic is being used as a, a cover for the, the further repression of, of people of Kashmir. And I agree with lots of what's been said earlier, that the world has to wake up, that this is a, this is a crisis, this is an emerging and deepening crisis. And they have to realise, as I think as Liam said, there are three nuclear powers going head to head here. And we have to realise, even if it doesn't want to wake up, even if it doesn't want to accept responsibility, the UK, I would say in particular, has a huge responsibility to get involved here. And I would urge, and I will urge them to do exactly that. 
I know having spoken to colleagues in, in Edinburgh, and Nicola Sturgeon was, was very clear that she's very, very concerned as what's happening in terms of human rights uh, abuses in Kashmir. And she again has reiterated her calls for self-determination for Kashmir has to, has to be respected. And I know that the Scottish Government has been in contact with the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office expressing serious concerns about the revocation of Article 370 and the, the decision to strip Kashmir of its autonomous status. And we have unreservedly uh, condemned the provocative language uh, used by India to deliberately create conditions. And we've called on uh, the Modi government to observe the Simla agreement and to allow a peaceful resolution of this crisis within the United Nations. The excessive use of force, detention, restrictions of, communi uh, of, of communication, the taking away of freedom of movement is not how a democracy should work. And the world is a dangerous enough place without yet another populist hard man trying to flex his muscles for short-term popularity. The, the world is a dangerous enough place without someone like Modi copying hard men around the world and taking the constitution and manipulating that constitution for short-term political gain. Um, it's wrong on every level. It's highly questionable the legality of what they're doing and it should be called out. And I think the United Kingdom, as I said earlier on, in particular has a responsibility to call it out. And what I um, will do today and I will speak to, to, to colleagues going forward is commit myself as the, the SNP spokesperson on international human rights and conflict resolution, commit myself and the party here at Westminster and in Edinburgh to work with everyone else across party um, and again outside of Westminster to do what we can to put pressure on government and others to find a just and lasting resolution to this conflict. conflict. As many people have said and that the president said himself, there's a humanitarian crisis and we have a moral obligation to act. We cannot, even if we want to pretend we don't know, we cannot pretend now that we do not know what is going on. And we in Scotland, as, as many other uh, colleagues have, we have a, a wonderful relationship uh, between our Pakistani and our, our Indian communities. The, the social cohesion cannot be undermined both communities have made a huge and valued contribution to making Scotland a far better place for them being there. And that is something that we cherish and we treasure and we will not let go lightly. So as I say, I commit myself and the party to work with colleagues across the House and outside of the House of Commons to make sure that we can do whatever we can to help find that just and lasting peace. Thank you very much, Brendan. I think you made some amazing points there. Um, I'm going to bring on, um, uh, I think, Christian. No, sorry, not Christian, sorry. Not Brent. Uh, so uh, I'm going to bring on, yes, Christian. Yes, can we get Christian on, please? James will be moving towards the end as he's uh, got an important meeting. So can we have Christian on next? Hi, it's James. Christian's on a call. Oh, yeah. sorry, James. Yeah, James, sorry. No problem. President Carr, it is good to hear from you again, sir. It seems a different lifetime ago when I was with speaking with you in Muzaffarabad in February as part of the APPG delegation um, to Kashmir. Uh, and it is sad to say that the situation was very bad when we were there, but it has actually got worse. The new domicile rules, domicile rules imposed in Jammu and Kashmir are simply unacceptable. They are an attempt to change the, in the balance of the indigenous population within the state. The issue with 
Kashmir and Pakistan and India is not bilateral, it's internationalist. We have to, we cannot simply walk away, it's many years ago now, but we cannot walk away from the United Nations resolutions of many years ago. We simply can't ignore them as if they, don't, they are not there. And it's through that internationalist solution that peace and the protection of human rights, I believe, will be sought. I think Liam made some very telling points regarding the role of third parties in fighting discrimination, fighting human rights, fighting um, the oppression of peoples, and that's what's happening in Kashmir. I hope the UK government can play its part in that, but there are clearly others who can also play that third party role, putting pressure on those countries and those states which do not abide to a level and a standard of human rights that we in the UK would accept. We wouldn't tolerate it for people within this country and therefore we're certainly not going to tolerate it elsewhere. The domicile law, I think, is another example of the lack of basic rights by the Kashmiri people. We need to, as a parliament, work cross-party, this is another party political issue, to continue to call for a solution that has the support of the international community. We simply cannot call from the sidelines. We have to work night and day. We have to, as politicians, ensure this is at the top of the foreign policy agenda, whether that's in newspapers or on the news. And we have to categorically show our support to those people who are being oppressed, not just in Kashmir, but throughout the world. I'm the chair of the Conservative Friends of Kashmir. I'm the vice chair of the APPG on Kashmir. I've worked closely with Labour colleagues. I'm sure we'll go forward with SNP colleagues and others to try and find a way that I, when I visited the line of control and I visited the refugee camps on the border of Azad and Jammu Kashmir and spoke firsthand to those people who haven't seen their family members for many decades, who have suffered human rights abuses, who have suffered appalling injuries. I agree with all the speakers, we cannot walk away from that, we cannot ignore that. We must continue to try to stand up for those values that all the speakers have spoken about today and go back to what I believe is, is fundamental to any functioning society, democracy, the right to self-determination, the right to freedom, the right to live in a free and open society. And that's what I will commit uh, myself to in the position that I hold. And I agree wholeheartedly with what each and every speaker has said so far. Thank you very much. Perfect. Um, if, uh, can we now have uh, Phil, Philip? Yes, I am in. Um, I'd just like to say I think we've got a, a what, what's uh, encouraging here is the level of consensus we have that not just cross party. I think if you actually look uh, other areas of the world, we've got some growing support uh, for um, uh, for action and and for restoring um, the rules based order that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, I think where we agree is that the Indian um, constitutional changes are illegal because uh, uh, it was very, very clear that the uh, changes were, any, any constitutional con changes regarding Kashmir could not be done unilaterally and these have been done unilaterally so it's very, very clear that they're illegal. It's also very, very clear that the in Indian authorities are out of order and excluding uh, people like Human Rights Watch, the United Nations and uh, Amnesty and others from, um, from access to the, uh, uh, to the region. So uh, where, 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 we, uh, where we need to go forward now is I think uh, getting an international um, coalition uh, that wants to see this, uh, this, this issue resolved. Um, now, 
if we look over the last two or three years, we've seen the, uh, the rules-based order in retreat, largely because the authoritarians have been using, um, I think, the lack of leadership in the, uh, in, in the free world, if you like, uh, while Trump has been president. Um, they've been using it as, a, um, uh, as an opportunity to, to, to push their agenda. Uh, we see, I, we can't divorce this whole problem from what's going on in China. Uh, even now we have seen the uh, conflict that, uh, that Liam alluded to uh, between China and uh, India. And as he's pointed out, there are three nuclear powers uh, involved um, uh, along those lines of control. Um, now, if we can actually get, looking forward with some optimism, if we want to look for some optimism or some opportunities, um, I think if we, if we look at uh, the possibility of Trump losing the election in the autumn, in, in, no, in November, and, uh, and um, a, an internationalist taking over in the United States, it doesn't change things automatically and immediately, but... Uh, where we've seen uh, Xi Jinping um, picking on the Australians for simply disagreeing with him and, and putting on, uh, uh, trying to put tariffs on, um, what we're seeing in Hong Kong, uh, where Xi Jinping and Modi are actually, uh, uh, well, even though they're in conflict, uh, we see that they're, they're actually uh, reinforcing each other's uh, authoritarian tendencies, um, where where uh, Modi changed the constitution uh, regarding Kashmir, uh, Xi Jinping then does the same with Hong Kong. With this, this, the rules-based order desperately needs to be re uh, reinstated, reinforced, and, 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 and that needs uh, proper leadership from the, from the free world. Now, uh, Britain's too small to give that leadership, and, and uh, from a European level, although I think Europe will support it, um, when it comes down to the European Council, you've always got uh, some countries who are desperate to keep in uh, on good terms with certain uh, with China. You've got others desperate to keep on good terms with India. You, you know, it, it, it's a very very difficult situation to get Europe to lead because it has the wrong structures to do that. Uh, but you, but the European marketplace and the and the possible use of sanctions. Um, they can be a massive, massive uh, uh, um, tool in actually bringing that this this world order back. Now, if we can if we can get some leadership from the United States, then I, I actually believe what's going on in Hong Kong now can actually help because uh, if if uh, if if the Western world, the free world, uh, takes issue with what uh, what China is doing, not just in Hong Kong but in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. Uh, we've seen even full sterilizations we've here heard from there, not a, uh, as well as these uh, camps. Uh, if they take on China, uh, then they've got to look at what India's doing as well, otherwise it looks partial. So I think if we can get, we, we desperately need this restoration of this liberal-based world order. Um, and it needs all of us to, to join in uh, and take part in that. And, very, and Britain and the United Kingdom will have to be part of that movement. And when it comes down to Kashmir, yes, we do have a historic uh, responsibility. Um, I think that uh, what uh, Liam said about George Mitchell um, uh, and, and, and Northern Ireland, uh, what we absolutely need for Kashmir then is, is, a, uh, is a George Mitchell for Kashmir to be nominated by the uh, international community. Uh, hopefully there we can start going forward and actually resolving some of these problems. Okay, um, thank you so much, Phil Philip, for that. Um, I'm going to bring on um, Jan, and after Jan, we're gonna have um, the president of Fazar Jammu and Kashmir. So if you could have Jan, and then we could um, have the president on after that. So if speakers could stay, um, at least till the president's address. Um, thank you very much. So can we have Jan? You couldn't hear me, eh? so I'll start again. Um, Mr. President uh, Masood Khan, members of parliament, um, 
in this dire circumstance, it's been very heartening to listening to everyone that people in power um, are fully aware of what's going on in Kashmir and are willing to stand up for, for the Kashmiri people. Um, and yet, as the last speaker was, was talking about, how do we get that um, will turn it into action? Because for the moment, without a rule-based um, international uh, order, it's like um, rush hour traffic with no traffic rules. Uh, it's bound to, to um, be an absolutely chaotic and bloody experience. And the ones in the biggest cars uh, are the only ones uh, winning in that situation. And we, we just cannot allow the world to keep going ahead in that direction. Um, and to come back to, to the specific situation of Jammu and Kashmir, and I'll try not to repeat what everyone else have already been saying. Um, I mean, there is, of course, yeah, the, the immediate absolute need for humanitarian aid. And we have to just um, somehow find a way to break uh, the chokehold of Modi uh, on Jammu and Kashmir um, and allow for aid agencies to come in, to, for resources to come in. And I believe it is possible if we get some of the big powers to talk and to take on India, but without that, Unfortunately, it does take longer. Um, but I want to focus what I talk about. The president mentioned a little bit in the, in the beginning, uh, the demographic changes that uh, India is allowing itself to make with the um, August 5th revocation of uh, Article 35 last year. Because it was just as there was a little glimmer of hope uh, after in 2018, we had the um, UN Human Rights Report um, on Kashmir, the first ever report in 70 years on the human rights abuses going on in Kashmir. And you would therefore think that it would give the international community an opportunity uh, to put the foot down to all those abuses taking place. Um, and of course, then uh, a nationalistic government like Modi's just step out and become even more aggressive to avoid this from happening and um, revoke the basic rights of the Kashmiri people. So they went from a situation of being occupied to actually a situation of being colonized. The Indian government ruled them totally now. Uh, and um, before, even if there was no hope of holding the forces really accountable to their crimes, at least there were some laws about it. Now they can do anything to the population and get away with it. And yeah, under the guise of the COVID-19, here last month, uh, mid-May, the Indian government then started to give these domicile um, certificates to people who apply then to uh, go to Kashmir. Indian people can apply to go to Kashmir and stay and work. And in six weeks, 25,000 people have gotten those permits. And as the president said in the beginning, these are people who, if they stay for just, I think it's 15 years, they, they have citizen rights forever. So this is a very active and very aggressive change of the democracy uh, in Jammu and Kashmir that's taken place right before our very eyes. Well, we're a little bit preoccupied with the corona, of course, but it's, it's happening. And this means, again, that the Kashmiris will go from an absolute nightmare uh, situation into a situation of not even having any hope in the long term for a change. So somehow we must you know, force our governments to intervene here. And... Um, if one looks at what, what are the options in this situation where um, it's like jungle law has taken over the world, uh, economic pressure still matters. So if we can get some heavyweight countries and the UK being one, I'm from Denmark myself, I say, so my country is not very much of a heavyweight, um, but the UK can put a pressure on if, um, if it does something on, on trade, I know you may not with Brexit have uh, too many options, uh, India being an important uh, trade, but still that's where 
there is the power to influence uh, the Indian government. And the other thing may be, you know, being more uh, from the activist state point, the BDS is working for Palestine. Not, it's not doing wonders or anything, but it's making a statement. Whenever an individual, and particularly somebody who's stood up in various situations, signs on to it, it matters. It shows the world uh, that uh, we care, and it shows the government abusing people that they cannot get away with it without it at least being noted. And I think, in a certain way, you know, that could help Kashmir not right away, but over time. Uh, and at least that's something again that we can do because there's, we have so few tools at our hands. Um, and and the, another thing that maybe, I don't know if the parliamentarians can take this um, to the government, I think that if we can somehow put a law or a very clear statement that demographic changes in a situation where we are awaiting for a UN um, General Assembly ruled uh, plebiscite, it's just not acceptable that those will not be counted for any number of people that are then moved into the situation, those vote will not be counted. Because that's of course always what is part of the whole process that they think, okay, after a decade or two, it will just be accepted. We have to put in the books that it cannot be accepted. I think I will just you know, stop then on a little hopeful note again that people in power are speaking out and um, U.S. Democratic President um, Joe Biden has said just recently that India should take all necessary steps to restore the rights of all the people of Kashmir. And we can't hope, I think, that Trump is listening, but we may hope, yeah, that there'll be a change and then that can benefit the Kashmiri people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to go back to a president now. Um, he's been waiting patiently. Thank you very much, President. I'm sorry we had to cut you off earlier. It was because of technical glitches. Um, we look forward to hearing from you now. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, can we can hear you now. Okay. okay. Now, <clears throat> first, I'm so pleased to listen to all these speakers because uh, they spoke passionately. They made substantive recommendations and they sp spoke out of conviction. And uh, uh, this conference, in a sense, was unique because uh, usually when we have webinars or conferences in the committees, committee rooms, uh, people are rushed. And uh, usually you end up with uh, two minute sound bites or short presentations. But today, the speakers took their time and analyzed the situation. Um, and uh, made their own recommendations. So this was very, very encouraging. And uh, as uh, one of the speakers mentioned, that there was a high degree of consensus around the recommendations that were made. So I'm really grateful to all of you. Now, I had pr prepared some remarks, but I'll uh, make them brief and go on to the operative part, which would contain some of the recommendations. Um, a few things that I want to highlight. Rights are being trampled in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir, and now the entire world knows it because of the media coverage. Um, what's happening there can be rightly characterized as genocide, ethnic cleansing, um, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And they are all accountable um, in accordance with international humanitarian law and international law. But India, is uh, committing these crimes with impunity because of the strategic and economic interests of the Western world tied with India. And because they, um, uh, some Western countries believe that they can use um, India as a proxy or as a counterweight to decelerate the pace of China, China's, this China phenomenon. Now, <clears throat> What I want to say here is that uh, these demographic changes that are taking place, they are uh, really very, very serious crime against humanity. 
according to in accordance with article 49 of the geneva convention icc statute uh, security council resolutions this ought to be stopped otherwise in two years time or three years time we won't have any kashmir to defend because india has put the entire process on a fa fast track and they are saying that uh, they would alter the demography of the valley of kashmir uh, in two to three years probably they would import uh, some two million people and then through gerrymandering they would also um, uh, delimit uh, these constituencies in a manner that the representation of the muslims in the so-called uh, um, union territory assembly would just disappear or vaporize or uh, it would be reduced drastically second thing that i want to say here is that there is a risk of a serious war not just between pakistan and india but now also between india and china and there is a kind of military alignment that is taking place so uh, <clears throat> from my point of view uh, all this has been triggered by india's uh, uh, quest and thirst for irredentism um, lebensraum and expansionism i mean they occupied the territory of jammu and kashmir and then they started threatening uh, china that they would uh, take back uh, aksai chin and that they would also attack azad jammu and kashmir um, the territory that i represent or gilgit baltistan through which the china pakistan economic corridor passes so there is a risk of war between uh, three nuclear capable countries nuclear powers and if that happens that would be a nuclear armageddon and that would be more dangerous than the world wars that we have fought so far with uh, their dire consequences this time uh, the entire globe would be affected god forbid if such a war breaks out now um, the west i would say the official west is quiet on these sinister developments in the, in the jammu and kashmir territory uh, the parliamentarians are supporting us the parliamentarians particularly from the united kingdom european union the us uh, congress attention was also stirred in a sense that they also started he uh, holding hearings uh, and uh, uh, their senators and uh, congressmen made statements but after covid 19 that process halted or slowed down but we have a groundswell of support from the world parliamentarians even from the asean region uh, we also have this coverage from the media the influential western media but official west all is quiet on the western front i would like to say that because they are not opening their lips at all uh, they do not think it politic to uh, call out india for what it is doing in the in occupied jammu and kashmir so india is getting away with murder so uh, one measure of success would be that if you could put pressure on your governments um, on 10 downing street or the fco to speak up and not make ambivalent and ambiguous statements but clearly um, side with the people of jammu and kashmir who are being brutalized now here i would say that uh, governments are silent the united nations is woefully um, inactive i mean they sometimes uh, issue these anodyne statements which mean nothing and which do not make an impact on the ground um, the united nations secretary general antonio guterres a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago i think he gave a statement uh, he appealed to the indian government to stop killing children in kashmir and uh, he said that don't detain and detain them and don't torture them but it had no impact on india whatsoever uh, i think that uh, the oic recently they held a meeting there is an oic contact group on jammu and kashmir but uh, the oic also needs to be activated and the united nations security council should take cognizance of this issue because it is on their agenda and if uh, uh, war and peace are involved in this case that is the fundamental responsibility of the security council to safeguard in accordance with the united nations charter
Now let me go to the operative part and I would say that what should be our to-do list or what should be um, a takeaway from this conference? Here are my suggestions. I would uh, uh, recommend to all these distinguished parliamentarians, um, today we also have cross-party representation. So I would say that please, can you have a dialogue with the FCO or with Mr. Dominic Rao? Uh, a couple of days ago, while responding to a question, he said that yes, the United Kingdom is concerned about human rights situation in the occupied territory or the Jammu and Kashmir. But he then hastened to add that uh, it's a bilateral issue. For God's sake, and somebody suggested here that let's drop that pretense. It is not a bilateral issue. It's a trilateral issue uh, between Pakistan, India, and the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And it's a quadrilateral issue because the United Nations is the guarantor for the realization of the right to self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So when Mr. Raab authoritatively says this is a bilateral issue, um, it's kind of diplomatic escapism. So I would urge you to work with the FCO and on 10 Downing Street to uh, get a, a balanced uh, substantive statement out of these, uh, these high offices. Second, I would say that um, uh, you would remember that before uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown, a debate on Kashmir was scheduled. And uh, I've been talking to different webinars and, uh, and such assemblies as we have today. And I have been appealing to the parliamentarians to uh, reschedule that meeting or, uh, and have a debate, have a full debate on the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, because the risk that it poses uh, uh, would not be confined only to South Asia, but it might, uh, I mean, these risks might uh, impact and impinge, impinge on uh, the peace and security of the rest of the world. Mm. Uh, India has been elected to the United Nations Security Council as a non-permanent member uh, starting January the 1st, 2021. Uh, they would be participating in its uh, deliberations. And I have three fears. They will try to delete the, uh, the uh, item of Kashmir from the agenda of the Security Council. Second, they would stop um, the debates, informal debates, that have started after a gap of 50 years. And third, they might try to undermine or terminate uh, the funding or the mandate of the United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan. And this is the last uh, vestige of the presence of the United Nations um, or United Nations Security Council in, in the subcontinent and along the line of control. Now, uh, I have also proposed to the OIC, and I've been proposing to the British parliamentarians, that we must start this BDS movement. It has succeeded in case of uh, uh, the uh, Palestine movement, and as one of the speakers pointed out, that even limited impact is important. Um, <clears throat> I think that it can be started, and it will have an impact, help us uh, start this movement. And here, we would need the support, not just of the uh, parliamentarians, but international civil society. Uh, <clears throat> I would also suggest that you have this um, all parties parliamentary Kashmir group, and uh, there are parliamentary groups all over the world in different parliaments. You have uh, friends of Kashmir groups in France and other European countries. You also have one in the European Parliament. Um, and uh, I, recently I was in ASEAN, Malaysia. They have also established these parliamentary groups. So I would urge you to create a network, talk to your peers all around the world because international pressure is important here. And uh, uh, the Interparliamentary Union is a platform that can be used to generate pressure on India to uh, stop its uh, brutalization of the Kashmiris. Uh, you have to negotiate these trade agreements and trade and investment agreements with India. And I would appeal to you 
to invoke uh, human rights treaties and conventions and human rights law in general when you're signing these trade agreements. It's easier said than done, but uh, I think that uh, some of the speakers mentioned it, that this is something which, uh, which needs to be done, which ought to be done. Uh, <clears throat> another appeal, which might sound very naive, but I'll say it all the same, that please stop selling weapons that kill Kashmiris. And please check it out, whether you're selling any uh, pellet guns, pellet firing shotguns to the Indians, because they use these pellet firing shotguns to blind people um, of all the ages, children, women, men, old men. So uh, I would tell you that despite all this barbarity and terrorism being exercised by India, a Kashmiri's resolve to get self-determination, liberty, and freedom has uh, strength over time. Even uh, after this uh, brutal siege, there is resistance. And these young boys are, uh, in fact, getting radicalized. And they say that uh, uh, there can't be a diplomatic solution. They're completely disappointed. They say that uh, we will have to pick up the gun uh, to defend our homes and hearts and neighborhoods and uh, our dignity and honor. So there's this drift towards uh, militarization of the Kashmir conflict. Uh, you go to Srinagar or to any part of uh, the occupied territory and ask young people, there's a youth bulge in Kashmir, and the young people are saying that uh, we must take coercive measures, counter coercive measures. Why? Because India is using the entire spectrum. Of course, it is uh, imposing this collective punishment on Kashmiris. It is using financial tools against them. It is making demographic changes. And it is using naked, lethal military machine to subjugate the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So how can diplomacy work alone? Um, I'm just raising a question. Moralizing to the fascists or to the extremists uh, has never worked in the past. It is not going to work now. Last century, an attempt was made to appease Hitler and Mussolini, and the attempts failed. And uh, the world had to pay a very heavy price. We are seeing a repeat of the same phenomenon here in South Asia. Let me also highlight that there's no dialogue between India and Pakistan. Pakistan and the people of Jammu and Kashmir are sitting on this side of the table, but on that side of the table, there's nobody sitting there. They've closed all doors for negotiation and engagement and dialogue. Now, this is very, very dangerous. Uh, I mean, when, for instance, there's this confrontation between China and India, at least their commanders are speaking to each other. This is also a confidence building measure. You can diffuse tensions, uh, but in case of uh, India and Pakistan, uh, there's no channel of communication open for dialogue. And uh, uh, one proposal that had been made by uh, Mr. Fahim Kiani, I want to reiterate it, he said that the British charities should uh, write to the Indian government and say that they want to visit Kashmir. Now, this is uh, um, a benign proposal. Why should they object to it? I know that they should, uh, they would object to it, but don't take their no for an answer. And <clears throat> let me also tell you that uh, 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 I have made this proposal. Let's create a Kashmir humanitarian fund. It should be an international fund. Um, if we cannot have a humanitarian corridor for the Kashmiris, at least we can create that, 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 that fund to uh, give them support and succor. Uh, now or in future, whenever the situation is ripe for that kind of intervention. Uh, I would also say that we are ready for mediation. We are ready for all sorts of mediation. Uh, it can be third-party mediation, it can be 
a mediation by the five members of the Security Council. It can be a mediation by a group of British politicians or statesmen. Uh, you have former prime ministers of stature uh, and uh, or European, a group of European mediators. We would welcome that. We would welcome another Mr. Mitchell or Mr. Holbrook. Uh, we are ready, the people of Jammu and Kashmir are ready. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, we also need to connect with the Indian civil society because uh, the Indian, when we're talking about India, we, we are not talking about 1.3 billion people of India. We're talking about Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and Bhatia Janata Party, these violent extremist outfits and parties. Uh, they have this doctrine of uh, cleansing and purifying India of all non-Hindus and so on. Uh, so this is religious supremacy, uh, which uh, is being used as a tool to terrorize people, not just uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, but all over India. So, but we need to connect with Indian civil society. We need to have dialogue with them because uh, many enlightened, liberty-loving Indians have protested against the policies of uh, Narendra Modi and his cohorts. So I think that the British parliamentarians are well placed to um, serve as a conduit. I would also say that they also give this message to the uh, Indian British community that when we talk about Kashmir or when we demand freedom or self-determination for Kashmiris, we are not being anti-India. Uh, we, we want to um, end this curse of colonialism and, uh, foreign occupation in that territory. Uh, lastly, I would say that uh, uh, Indians deliberately create uh, this fog of falsehoods and lies. You know, when they're brutalizing people, they would violate uh, the line of control. Then they would say Pakistan is sending terrorists across the line of control and that they are fighting those terrorists there and their figures do not match. I mean, Sometimes they say that there are only 230 militants. Uh, sometimes they say there are 300 militants, these young boys who uh, ran away from their houses to uh, safeguard the dignity of uh, Kashmir, uh, ill-trained and ill-equipped. And then they say that we have already killed 100 boys and we have arrested 100 boys and the remaining would be tackled. And they say that then they boast that they, nobody can cross the line of control. And then they manufacture, craft these lies to blame Pakistan. I want to make this statement with full authority and full authenticity that we are not sending any terrorists across the line of control, period. Uh, and nobody believes them, but they manufacture these uh, lies to consolidate their extremist electoral base. For instance, I'll give you an instance. For instance, uh, they, these, they gave these the domicile certificates to 25,000 people in six weeks on a fast track. And then what they publicized, among other things, they publicized that there is one ex-civil servant from Bihar. Why? Because in Bihar, they are facing elections. And uh, they want to present this as a trophy that uh, if you vote for the BJP and RSS duo, uh, then people would have more opportunities in Kashmir and uh, would have an opportunity to consolidate their occupation of the territory. I stop here. Once again, I want to thank Mr. Fahim Kiani and also thank all the parliamentarians who have touched our hearts. I mean, uh, what they said was, as I said in the beginning, was both emotional and sentimental and at the same time cerebral and very substantive. And thank you so much for being with us uh, for Kashmir today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. That was, um, as always, very um, detailed um, and very passionate. Could I now have out of one, please? Um, and after that, I'll just be reading a statement from Altaf Ahmed Bar. He had to leave early, but if you could have Mr. Altaf Wani next, please. Thank you, Uzma. First of all, let me thank Fahim Kiani for organizing this webinar conference. 
and also the parliamentarians who spoke during this uh, and really as president said they touched our hearts and i'm really encouraged uh, in the way uh, the parliament spoke and after president's speech i don't think i have anything to add uh, about kashmir about what is happening in kashmir and uh, listening to the parliamentarians i can to know the way president has been lobbying with the parliamentarians and prem kiani uh, the things have materialized and people are very much know of what is happening in kashmir what they need to do uh, i it is encouraging that parliamentarians are ready to work for kashmir they are ready to make the uh, the peace and uh, try to create more and more support in the parliament in favor of kashmir and pressurize the government uh, in uh, great britain and also elsewhere to make some headways in the resolution of kashmir and stop the violence in kashmir as president was telling most of people uh, talked about uh, the atrocities and the genocide law which india passed and what are its implications on the local population i'll just uh, go a uh, very brief on the two policies they have in the new education policy which india has enacted after this genocide law the new education policy on behalf of india to rewrite the textbooks and whitewash the history local history of kashmir and to write it the way the indian uh, bjp government likes it and this is the softenization of kashmiri education this is one of the elements which i want to highlight in this and this the next is the uh, the new media policy now you can see uh, in kashmir media has become uh, now a handout of the, the government uh, handout uh, there is nothing in the in the media as it is because all the uh, media personnel they are being harassed they are being prosecuted and uh, there is um, other bans on them and restrictions on them and the content is being uh, properly uh, under scrutiny by the government agencies and then they, that is released so these are the new ways of uh, the, how they want to uh, de uh, demoralize the population of kashmir how they want to uh, keep them under uh, their colonial rule uh, president dealt uh, with the, all the issues uh, very uh, in detail how uh, the things are shaping in kashmir what will happen yeah, the way the, uh, the indians are pushing our youth towards the violent means Uh, to take arms against the operation and that will uh, escalate more and more tension in the region and in that way uh, we will have a very worsening situation in this uh, at the end i will thank you all the parliamentarians and hope you will carry your support for the kashmir and will keep on working for this and i thank you for mpani for providing me this opportunity thank you all Thank you very much. Um can we now have a uh, question please? Thank you so much for waiting. Um thank you uh Osma um also th thank you everyone uh, assalamu alaikum and especially uh thank you to his excellency the president as well for uh not only his uh, moving and, and detailed speech uh, but also for, for giving up uh, a lot of time for what I can imagine is a a very um difficult time uh, over there. Um I I'll try not to repeat a lot of what my colleague said uh mainly because I I much of they've prepared in much more passion uh than than I could possibly uh, attempt um but certainly the details for for Maltaf were certainly very very moving um I stood on the steps of uh, Berry town uh town center uh, about 10 months ago um at, at a Kashmir solidarity uh rally uh, and obviously at that point we were saying that i think we were about on about day 32 at that point that that was already 30 day, 32 days too long of the fact we're now 11 months uh down the line and the occupation is still ongoing is quite frankly a travesty of justice of human rights and is quite frankly uh just <laughs> Um, it is very difficult to put into to words just how how abysmal uh, this situation actually is uh so see, since then I've been working very closely uh with my colleague from from Barry North James Daly uh, to keep on highlighting uh, the concerns of 
the Kashmiri residents uh, from from Berry uh, that actually, you know, this has gone on far too long. Far too many people have been raped, abused, tortured, and murdered, uh, and we should have been speaking out not just on a national stage but an international stage. Uh, and unfortunately, we have been far too quiet uh, on this particular topic. Uh, what I think is vital is that we do actually start speaking up because there will be no real change uh, until this is seen on an international level. Uh, so whilst, whilst we are just one small nation, we still are an important nation. We still do have a strong voice and that's, that voice has to be one of condemnation. Uh, we cannot tolerate uh, what, what is being taking place. Uh, and it's, it's not India, it, it's Modi. And I, I think we can all uh, acknowledge that wh whichever word you choose for Modi, it still doesn't come in anywhere near uh, the the uh, abuse that he has been allowed to take place in his name. I, I prefer to think of him uh, for what he is. And by definition, right now, he is a terrorist. Uh, he's forcing too much heartache, pain, terror, uh, and misery on far too many people. Um, and until this is called out on the international stage, and, and dare I say, I'd, I'd, I'd prefer to see him actually in The Hague, um, you know, our, our mission still is to continue. Uh, so what we do all need to do, we do need to be uh, highlighting this still on the national level. Uh, but then we need, uh, as His Excellency said, we need that international cooperation. Uh, because until we start having the likes of the UN, the EU, uh, and all the uh, important national and supranational bodies coming together in condemnation for the Indian constitutional changes, but also the, the UN resolutions that are being ignored, we need to see action. We need to see these re resolutions maintained because it, it's far too weak to say that actually this is a local issue that needs to be addressed uh, by Pakistan and India because after 70 years, it hasn't been addressed by uh, Pakistan and India and it's not going to. Um, it, quite frankly, in, in, in the UN declarations of human rights, there's a very fundamental point which is just being ignored and that's the fundamental right to self-determination. And until the, the residents of uh, Jammu and Kashmir actually have that choice, and that has to be their choice, if they wish to remain occupied by India, if they want to be an independent Kashmir or even join with Pakistan, that has to be their choice. And, and that will have to be a fully internationally recognized referendum. And I think that ultimately has to be stage two for what we aim at. One is an endless blockade, uh, occupation uh, and torture, rape and murder but then we do have to have this referendum ASAP. Uh, so whilst, uh, whilst being on the right of the political spectrum, I don't particularly sign up to the word of solidarity. What I will say is the people of Kashmir have my full support in working towards uh, what can only be the, the final uh, solution to actually bring peace to this uh, region um, because we do need to allow the people of Kashmir to, to make that choice. We do need to allow them to choose how they want to be governed and, and until that actually happens I can't see peace. I, I, all I can see is more torture and murder and that absolutely cannot be allowed to continue for one day longer. Um, so I, I, I will be continuing uh, with the work uh, alongside uh, my colleague James in, with the APPG I will be uh, continuing uh, sending off my correspondence to the Foreign Secretary and, and the FCO, but we do need many, many more people out there. Uh, and if that is a truly national effort in the UK to, to bring about the change we need to for foreign policy, uh, we need to be the drivers because ultimately we helped create the mess. We need to be there to actually resolve it too. Um, so like I said, I, I was ho hoping to be brief, but if there's one message, uh, I can send to you, it, it is one of so, full support uh, and that will be continuing until this matter is fully resolved. Uh, so hopefully that goes uh, some way uh, to offer some reassurance, but there, there is support uh, from all sides uh, of Parliament. We just need to make sure that support goes higher up and is fully internationally recognised. Um, thank you, Christian. I think what really stood out for me there was that it's this is not a left or right or centre issue. This is a issue which crosses across the political spectrum because it's all about human rights and I think that's the most amazing thing is when you look at these conferences it's always such a um, mixed 
sort of approach. Um, and I think that's what shows how universal and important this issue is. Um, I'm going to bring back the president because I believe he wants to, he wants to just comment on a few things. So um, if I could have his excell excellency on, please. No, as a matter of fact, when you have exhausted the list of speakers, then I would make a brief intervention. Go ahead with other speakers. Okay, so um, I... So we have one final speaker, but he's he's not so well today. So instead, um, I have got his statement with me. So I'm just going to read a bit of it. Um, he sends his regards to the president and everyone for um, a, you know coming today, and he thanks them. He appreciates their efforts. Um, so out of Ahmed Butt would like to just uh, make a few comments um, at the conference. Um, he'd firstly like to highlight obviously, as was discussed in this conference, the several human rights violations, uh, especially in the past year or so, how things have intensified and the media blackout. Um, and he also wanted to kind of uh, uh, also talk about how what's happening now in Kashmir is not just a political and social sort of uh, breakdown, um, but also an economic breakdown. So um, Artif Ahmed but wanted to really emphasize about what's happening and taking place is a push for an economic breakdown to kind of force Kashmiris to become desperate, push them into a situation where they have to accept move from a Modi's government. Furthermore, um, he highlights basically how demographic change, um, and in particular the issue of 25,000 domicile certificates um, to non-Indigenous people um, so quickly um, will affect the region. It will obviously cause a lot of tensions in the region, and what you are seeing is that these applications are being fast-tracked by the Indian government over indigenous Kashmiri applications. Um, he also wanted to comment on just this kind of some of the statistics that we have. So uh, well, 142 Kashmiris, including four women, martyred, 1,300 people critically injured, 910 houses damaged, molestations, a uh, $15 billion loss to the economy, and around 270, 270 crore per day lost to the economy. Crore, I believe, is uh, um, in the millions and billions in Indian rupees. Um, he also wanted to talk about how in the month of June 2020, 54 Kashmir youth have been killed. So he was kind of just stressing on some of the key points or key developments in the past 10 months. However, he wanted to really specify on the death of uh, a um, grandfather said this has made headlines internationally, globally, this kind of very haunting image of a three-year-old sitting on the body of his dead grandfather who was placed there by Indian forces. Um, the Indian government alleges that this was due to that the uh, grandfather was killed in cross-firing between militants and the army. Uh, the family alleged that the uh, grandfather was killed by Indian officers. Um, from the account given by the young boy or the young grandson, three years old, um, of Bashir Ahmed, uh, the, Bashir Ahmed's grandson actually highlights that it's the Indian officials that killed his grandfather. So this is an, uh, one very recent, uh, rather frightening event that's taken place this week. And um, I'm sure if we Google Bashar Ahmed, what will come up, there's a very haunting image there. So you only need to highlight those um, features that have taken place recently. He also wanted to kind of uh, pick up on how um, one kind of welcome step that we've seen is the UN Secretary General's statement about Kashmir. Um, although he welcomes it, he wants to highlight how actually we need to implement it. There needs to be actual force or action because we've gone past the stage of highlighting. There has to be an actual strong uh, economic, social, military effort to do something about what's going on. Um, and he also highlights how Kashmiris haven't received a, really, a relief package, as most areas have. So whereas most countries have a relief package to deal with COVID-19, um, that's been lacking in Kashmir. So the Kashmiris are really struggling at the moment with the current uh, sort of um, situation with COVID-19. And he lastly wanted to finish off by uh, talking about or suggesting that we actually get NGOs and relief organizations to not just write to the UN Secretary General but to actually push the Indian government to allow observers and allow help into the region 
especially as the health sector there is quite neglected. Um, so he stressed on those points. Apologies if it feels a bit broken up and I was explaining it. I probably didn't deliver as best as him, but I was kind of given a bit, um, some bullet points of his speech. I think he, this was his plan. So I was just reading some of those points out. So thank you for bearing with me on that. Um, also, I want to thank everyone for coming today as well. We're just going to finish off by going back to the president. Um, so if uh, we I can... So. I think so. Claire wants to come in for two minutes. Oh, yeah, and also actually, yeah, let's have Claire first, and then we'll go to the president. So this is Claire from Let Kashmir Decide, and Claire's done some amazing work recently with Kashmir. Thank you, Claire. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Fahim, once again for convening this, uh, Mr. President. Thank you for joining us, and grateful thanks to all the parliamentarians over here. Um, you know, because we're all working together. All those ideas they were so constructive. The passion. I think what's frustrating me is that Kashmiris have been waiting 72 years for their right to self-determination and their rights to have their human rights respected, and it's not happening. Um, we've not had a condemnation from our government. We're all working at this level. We're all not passionate, but where is that international community that's coming for this? And I fear we're running out of time, and I think we need to work harder and faster. Thank you. Oh, am I? Oh, no. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Claire. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so I just mute. think... Somebody's saying I'm on mute. I'll just keep talking. I just think we need to work harder and faster. So if you've got the power there to bring together... I mean, the United Nations, it's against um, all yes, their human rights resolutions, <laughs> and it's against the Geneva Convention, and we, we need to work faster and quicker. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'm just going to go back to His Excellency now. His, uh, I, Mr. President, are you okay to comment now? Uh, I think he's just setting something up there. Your Excellency, are we okay to come back to you? All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Yes. Are you Uzbaru soon? Hey, yes, yes, okay. I am. So let me say, the uh, first thing I want to say is that you are a, a hero or heroine, whichever word you prefer, because uh, you won our hearts and minds, the hearts and minds of the people of Jammu and Kashmir when you tabled that motion in the Labour Party conference. So thank you so much, Uzma, for doing that. Mm, that was a seminal moment for us uh, in the British parliamentary support to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, second is that I'll appeal to everybody uh, who is participating in this conference that uh, let us change or please help us change this lexicon about terrorism and self-determination. Because India says that it is fighting terrorism in the Indian-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, and this is not true at all. I mean, 900,000 troops for 230 militants. And uh, India has uh, one of the biggest armies in the world. Uh, they have uh, the regular forces, three corps there. They also have uh, uh, Central Reserve Police. They also have local police. They have border security force, 900 militants, for God's sake. Doesn't make sense. There's no terrorism going on in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Second, uh, please help us start diplomatic discourse because uh, a, a, its suspension by India is imperiling the peace and security, not just of South Asia, but of the entire world. We want peace tables, we want negotiation tables, and uh, we want. Uh, a new beginning, as a matter of fact. I mean, we want that uh, Kashmiris should be given an opportunity to exercise their right to self-determination through democratic means. I would say and all 
Mr. President, um, you, I think you're, gl you're glitching cities, slightly. And towns and villages of the Yes, can I continue? That um, your Excellency, I think you're glitching slightly. Um, I don't know if it's your internet connection. Maybe uh, if you could just check. Yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me now clearly? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, very quickly, I would say the first things first that please help us stop these killings in the occupied territory because every day dozens of young men are gunned down in these cordon search operations of fake encounters. Uh, second is that please help us stem and stop this uh, process of land grab in the garb of new domicile rules um, and uh, this uh, highway robbery of um, okay, uh, so sorry, Your Excellency, I think you're having a few technical glitches. Um, I think what might be best is if we probably conclude. Um, if you could maybe write a statement. Jobs and livelihood. Hello. And businesses of the Kashmiris. Um, what we hello, can you hear me now? Because hello, and um, Miss Pre uh, Miss President, I think we're having issues with your connection. So if you could, um, I think we might need to conclude there. Yeah, I think he's yep, he's disconnected. <clears throat> so I think the president's had a few issues with his connection, so he's disconnected. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today. I think we can conclude a little bit. I mean, let's see if we can just quickly get him back on. If not, then I think we can wrap up. And maybe if there's any questions you guys have, we can pass them to the president. I think he's just reconnecting now. Let's just see if it works. Um, can you hear me? Um, yes, uh, we can hear you. Can you? All right. Just this uh, two things that I want to say. One is that uh, one suggestion that has come from all the speakers is that we should transition from the rhetoric or statements to action. And the last point is let's dedicate today's webinar to that uh, uh, granddad who was killed in cold blood and that hapless kid three-year-old kid who had to be exposed to this trauma. So uh, let's dedicate this seminar, this webinar. I appeal to Mr. Fahim Kiani to dedicate this seminar to the granddad and to the grandson. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I want to thank you for um, your regards as well. When I tabled that motion at Labour Party conference, I wanted to make sure that <clears throat> the Labour Party was committed and had something ratified to support Kashmiri self-determination. Um, obviously what followed on afterwards was, <clears throat> you know, to my surprise, I didn't expect uh, the reaction that motion would create actually, um, and kind of the anger it would cause within the Modi government. But I think the fact that it created that reaction was a sign that actually it, it, how historical it was that the Labour Party stood up as Europe's largest party um, to say, you know, we want to support self-determination. And the motion itself was very neutral. It didn't take a side. It simply supported Kashmiris and their self-determination. So thank you so much for acknowledging that, Your Excellency. Um, I think one thing uh, myself and Fahim would like to say is thank you so much to everyone for coming. And I'll just give I us like to. I would like to thank the uh, Conservative Party as well. Uh, Three times uh, the motion had been debated uh, in the British Parliament, and that motion was tabled by the Conservative Party. So I'm very Thank thankful you. to Conservative and uh, Phil Bannon as well, uh, Liberal Democrats and uh, the Labour and uh, Scottish National Party as well. They always stand uh, with the people of Kashmir a right to self determination, and Jan yeah. Taylor and other great leaders as well. Yeah. 
So thank you very much. Thank you for the cross party work, everyone from every party that's getting involved. Um, uh, just I think it's really wonderful because often when we feel like things are so po polarised, I think one really beautiful thing is that these conferences, every party, every political spectrum comes together. Um, everyone from the political spectrum comes together and works together on this issue because it's so important. So I want to thank everyone for taking time out today from your busy schedules for us. Um, what we will do is we will be like making notes on some of the suggestions and recommendations and we will hopefully be sending them out to you so you can all take a look. So we've got a summary and conclusion of notes for reference so we can actually act on those. Um, we've also noted down what the president has said um, and his excellent recommendations too. So we will be sending out a release to everyone um, and they can also add to it in case we've missed anything out. So thank you so much. And um, we'll be kind of updating you soon. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Claire, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. No, Mr.